This morning, our, we're continuing our eight unusual places to find blessing. Eight unusual. That's the number four. I want to mention to you that my brother is with me. My sister couldn't come. She was sick. But this is my little brother. Stand up, little brother. I want him to see you. All right. Good deal. He's a lot smaller than I am. And uh, our, our youngest brother is actually our biggest brother. He's been at the table longer than we have. But anyway, we appreciate our family, and it's, we've been having a great time. He, most thing he does is eat. He can eat. Boy, you should have seen this. We had pizza Friday night. He ate a half a pizza. And I said, man, you did good. And I took the other half home. I don't know if he's eat that yet or not, but we're having a good time giving him a hard time. This morning... This beautiful attitude, as Billy Graham calls these, gives us great hope. And we're talking about unusual places that you find blessing. And today, Jesus said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. They shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall Be satisfied, or as the King James says, be filled. And I was thinking about what's so unusual about God blessing righteousness. And I thought back in Wednesday night's uh, Grove session, a class that I'm doing for the more mature people, excuse me, that are in my group. But anyway, we, uh, they're actually a little bit older, but they're mature. And uh, Greg Goschel is our speaker. I love to hear him speak. He's a great communicator. He was talking about when he had, was dating his soon-to-be, uh, once and is today, his wife. And he was a new Christian, and he'd found a, the best believers that he could find, the strongest Christians that he could find to sort of be his mentor. And he asked him a question. He said, uh, would you mind telling me... At, the most liberal that you can, what we can do as we date. And so the man said to him, he said, well, what's your goal? And, of course, he didn't have a goal. And so Greg Goschel said, uh, his mentor said, your goal is purity. And uh, he said he hadn't gone very far, a few statements, and he realized we couldn't go very far. And so we moved the wedding date up, he said, three times before they ever got hitched. I thought that was hilarious. But the reason that this is an unusual place, when was the last time you were with someone that was trying to get as close to God as they possibly can, rather than trying to get as close to the world as they possibly can and still feel like they're going to make it into heaven. We live in an age where people are doing their best to do as many things as possible, sometimes questionable, and still feel that they're going to make it to heaven, everything's going to be okay. And so when you talk about blessed Are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness? Blessed are they. It's an unusual place. It's not the run of the mill. But it's those who experience God's greatest blessing. And so this is what we're looking at this morning. And as we talk about righteous people, who was the first person in the Bible that God called righteous? Who? Who? Abraham? No. Nope. Noah. Noah was the first that was called righteous by God. And the scripture says in uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And there are two two ingredients in a righteous person's life. Those, they are blameless. Notice it didn't say perfect. None of us are perfect. But we are seeking 
to be righteous. We're after righteousness with all of our hearts. But we're not perfect. But we can be blameless. And that means we're not causing anybody to stumble. That means that if there's a problem, we're not the cause of the problem. And the second thing is the fellowship with God. Noah walked with God. I get excited when I think about that. Walking with God. What a wonderful experience it is to fellowship with God and to know that we are living a life that, we, that God is walking with us. Here we see these two aspects, doing the right things, being blameless, and having the right relationship with God, walking with God. And in the Old Testament, righteousness is often connected to the law of God. In Psalm 1, the, that's the theme of a psalm, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he does meditate day and night. And he goes on and said, it's not so about those, the evil people, the unrighteous. It says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the evil shall perish. And we see the righteous man. He, he is meticulous about doing what he knows to do to the best that he can. Doing the right thing. Having the right relationship goes hand in hand. And so this makes righteousness and those who pursue it and hunger and thirst after it to be an unusual place. And when you and I realize some things about this, we'll see it. Number one, if you are passionately pursuing righteousness this morning, you are in an unusual place. Passionate, passionately re, that running after righteousness. It's not those who have attained righteousness. I'm so glad Jesus did not say, blessed are the perfect. For they shall receive blessing. But he said, if you're running after righteousness, if you are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, you are blessed. God blesses you because we know you cannot earn God's blessing. That God blesses us when we don't deserve it. In fact, every blessing that we receive is, is uh, by grace from God. We don't earn those blessings. Even when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, that gift is not because you have finally got good enough. In fact, I remember when I was on my first staff assignment, I was an associate, and uh, there were lots of folks coming forward. It was during the charismatic renewal and there was a couple there, and they later became a part of a church. And the daughter, even the last time I was at Southeastern, was working at the college. But he had a pack of cigarettes in his pocket when he was baptized in the Spirit. And you know, I was brought up in a movement that really emphasized outward holiness. And if you did that, God wouldn't do anything for you, but... I'm sure he didn't realize that in our circles you had to get rid of that. And here God baptized him in the Holy Spirit, set him free from nicotine, and he became one of the stalwart members of the church. You don't earn God's blessing. You don't work for God's blessing. You just run after righteousness. And God's blessing will overtake your life. If you are pursuing righteousness passionately, you will be blessed of God. He blesses those who are pursuing righteousness. In Psalm 63 and verse 1, the psalmist talks about thirsting after God. One of the sermons that I remember that Rose Stone preached when they were pastors of my home church 
before they ever took their first mission's assignment. It's found in the book of Psalms, and she, she, her, her text was, As the heart pants after the water brook, so pants my soul after thee, O God. And she preached on thirsting after God and going after God. The psalmist said in Psalm 63, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. And so the psalmist talks about it. Isaiah talks about it. Come, you that are thirsty, he says, buy of me without money and drink and be satisfied. Why do you spend your money for that which does not satisfy? God satisfies the deepest longing of a person's heart. And he blesses those who are pursuing righteousness. And there, there are many things that I could say to you. John believed that in 1 John 2. I won't take time to turn to it. Verses 12 through 17. But he talks to the young. He said the word of God abides in you. And he talks to the fathers, the elderly. And he says, you know God. And he said, but his message was, love not the world, neither the things of the world. For if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You can't have a divided heart and go after God. It has to be single-hearted that we go after God. And so perfect righteousness not required for blessing, but it ought to be the direction that we're moving in, pursuing. If we want to enjoy his blessing, pursue righteousness with all of our heart. And if, if you have made perfect righteousness your goal, you are in an unusual place. Matthew chapter 6, Matthew writing all of this, this is part of a Sermon on the Mount, verse 33, where he says in the preceding verse that, the, that the, the unbeliever is looking after a place to live and clothes to wear and food to put on the table. But he said to you, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. You see, the, the righteousness that we pursue is perfect because it's His righteousness. This is the standard. It has to be God's righteousness and not our own. And Matthew talks about this quite a bit in this chapter. And he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness, and he's talking about almsgiving there, in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And the scripture says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast about their works. And so he's talking about God's righteousness being imparted and imputed to our lives. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And he says, Paul said, I count everything as loss except for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish and be, be found in him not having in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Philippians 3, 8 and 9. 
And then in the 12th verse, he says, not that I've already obtained this, all of this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold for which of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Can I ask you this morning, are you straining and stretching in this race? Are you reaching out to take hold of what God has provided for you? Or are you settled in and satisfied with less than God's best? Are you going for the whole enchilado? You're going for the awards. You're going to cross the finish line. You won't be perfect in this world, but you can always be moving forward. I remembered, I think this is, I could not find it in my notes. That's so frustrating. And uh, I'd have to go through all my sermons from last year, and that's, I'm not doing that. But I remember part of it. It said there was a Messianic Jew who made this statement, and he said, perfection is our goal. Pursuing perfection is our mission. Perfection is our goal, but pursuing it is our mission. That's why we emphasize growth here. That's why we tell believers, you should never rest comfortable where you are. You should always be going forward. Because no matter how rich you are in the blessing of God, there is more. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. There's more available for us. Amen. And so we press forward in this race to obtain what Christ has provided for us. So is perfection your goal? If it is, like myself, you'll be saying, it's not. I haven't re- it's not the goal that I've reached yet. I'm not there yet, but I'm pursuing it. That's my mission in life. I'm pursuing perfection. Hallelujah. Oh, it feels good. It feels so good. You know, I grew up in a church where there was great emphasis on external. I've told you many times, ladies would wear their sleeves down to here and their dresses up to here. That wasn't too bad up here. And down to the floor. But their tongue, some of them, you couldn't get it on the altar. You'd have to widen the building and build an extra length on the altar to get that wagon tongue and get it dedicated to God. And what I mean is, they'd speak in tongues on Sunday and gossip on Monday. And God hates that. God hates that stuff. He wants us to be entirely sanctified. Amen? I'm not there yet, but I'm moving in that direction. Praise God. You know, I started in in the last few years asking myself some questions. If God would call me home right now, would he be pleased with what I just did? Or would I have to be trying to fumble around to explain it to him? And I I made up my mind. I said, mind, we are going to do what pleases God to the best of my ability with the Holy Spirit's help. I want to live my life daily, moment by moment, knowing that if I stand before God like Steve Brown did, when he came home from church and sat down in his recliner and his wife found him, about 15 minutes later, they estimate, no pulse and unconscious, and he was really dead. They got him, his heart beating again, but he never came back. And he's before God. When I walked up the ramp into the Oliver's home on uh, Friday evening, I don't know if we built that ramp or not, if somebody from here. But Steve Brown, I found, I didn't know this about Steve, was a master carpenter. He had been once the superintendent of the South Carolina District of the Assemblies of God. And in his retirement, part of the ministry he was doing, 
was finding people. Many of them could not afford to buy the materials. And he would get folks to, to donate it. And he was building ramps so that people could get in and out of their house. Don't you know he's glad now that he did it? He's glad for everything he sacrificed. When we get through in this life, God's going to call us home. But I want to stay busy because I don't want to go one day early. It's going to be wonderful. But I'd like to see my great-grands grow up now. We've seen, we've seen the grandkids grow up. I like to see the great-grands grow up. If you think grandchildren are wonderful, wait till you get great-grands. They're greater than the grands. They are, oh, they're outstanding. But here's the deal. Pursuing perfection. That's our goal. But our mission is the pursuit of it. And then you, you're in an unusual place if you experience the full impact of his promise here. Notice what he said. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Each of the Beatitudes so far, internal. Poor in spirit, that's internal. Poor in spirit, poverty of spirit, mourning over national sins. All unrighteousness grieves a person who is poor in spirit and makes them homesick for the new heaven and the earth, new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. 2 Peter 3.13. We're satisfied neither with personal righteousness alone, nor social justice alone. They cry for both. In short, they long for the advent of the messianic kingdom. When the king comes, the king is coming. When he comes, there will be peace. Blessed are the meek. They submit to God's dealings. Blessed are they that mourn. All of this is internal. And righteousness is internal too. I've already told you, I grew up where it was external. I could tell you some stories of people, how they treated leadership in our church I grew up in. And I can tell you stories of people who dropped dead and were dead before they hit the floor. And as a kid watching this, I said, I don't think it's good to mess with God. You may be a crispy critter. Because when God says it's enough, it's enough. And that's serious business. And so it put a healthy fear of God in my life. And I, I respect authority. I don't always agree with authority, but I respect authority. And I want to treat them respectfully. And I, I eliminated some scripture I had in here about how God teaches us to deal with people. He says, deal with, don't rebuke an elderly man. Treat him like your father. Don't rebuke an elderly woman. Treat them like your mother. And your relationship with younger women should be as if they're your sister's. And with the younger men as if they're your brothers. And I believe that our relationships in the church, God is very interested in how we mesh with other believers. And whether we are helping to encourage them and receiving encouragement from them, that's very important. Because God intends that. And when you're seeking after perfection and righteousness, you will do it. And when you want the full impact of God's blessing, I close with this thought. John Piper, I like to read John's work, his writings. In this passage of Scripture, he entitles it this way, From Emptiness to Fullness. If we were to divide up this congregation this morning, which side would you be on? 
Would it be the empty side? Or would it be the full side? And he talks about the movement of, this, of these uh, beatitudes from poverty, from poverty, from emptiness to plenty. That's what we have pictured here. When we empty ourselves of everything that challenges God's position in our life, then God can fill us with the good righteousness. He can come and satisfy us. But first of all, there has to be that emptying. If we're full of everything else, full of the world, and this today, you know, I realize we need to be good citizens and be in touch with what's happening, but I'm not filling myself with the garbage of this world. Not even the political stuff. The Bible says, set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And that's where my focus is, because my hope is not from man. My hope is from the Lord. Man cannot help me, but God can, and God will. If I line myself up, he will fill me up until there's no room left in my life. He will gorge me. That's what the word means. Now, we have enough chicken over there this morning to gorge everybody in this room. If you didn't bring anything, please don't go get any chicken because we got uh, several hundred pieces, and it, we don't want to try to keep that. We want to eat it, so you're very welcome to go with us. You know, sometimes I said if everybody brings Jello, we'll have a Jello lunch. But this time it's fried chicken. We may have a fried chicken lunch. But whatever, please help us eat it. And if you're a member of the church, we need a quorum to do our business meeting. So I hope you will stay and join us. And if you're a member, you must stay because we need all of them today to make it happen. But here's the deal. Poverty of spirit. One of my favorite pos passages in the Psalms is Psalm 113, verse 7 through 9. It says, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap, from their mourning pit. That's what it is. To make them set with princes. He makes the barren woman a joyous mother of children. That's my God. Whatever our needs are, God is big enough to meet those needs. He is able to do what we need done. I know, and I, I hope, I don't know if, my, if Trace is here today or not. I hope she don't mind if I tell you a story. But after Michael was born, you know, she had appendicitis, and they didn't know it. They ruptured, and it messed her up inside. And then she, she wanted a little girl so bad. And when she would talk about little girls, she would start crying. Because she couldn't have anything, she thought. And then one day she was riding with Michael. He was about this big. And she was, uh, she was weeping because of the fact that she wanted a little girl to go along with him so badly. And Michael said to, him, to her, here's a kid, four or five years old. He said, Mama, you know everything in God's time. When God gets ready, God will do what he wants to. He'll do what's right. And he looked up at her and he said, I can't believe I'm having to have this talk with you. <laughs> it wasn't but days until she found out she was pregnant. I serve a God who knows no impossibilities. I serve a God who reigns today supremely. And he loves us so much. He doesn't want us to live a spiritual life that's impoverished, empty, void of fulfillment. He wants us to be filled. Feed me till I want no more. Feed me, Lord. Fill me up. 
And that should be our daily desire as we wait upon our God. What I want you to take away from this service, a healthy pursuit of righteousness. There are some things that I don't do because they're not good for my spiritual life. The Bible doesn't say I can't, but I don't because they're not good for me. And I'm not going to do what hurts me spiritually. I'm going to try to do exactly what helps me. Amen? What are you pursuing in your life? What are you going after? Is it the righteousness of God or your own? Are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? When we're born again, God imputes righteousness to us, which means on the basis of the perfection of the gift of Christ on the cross and his resurrection, he applies that to our life and treats us as if we never sinned. He forgives every sin. But after we're saved, he encourages us now begin to pursue righteousness in your daily life. In other words, become what I've already said you are. Pursue it with all of your heart. Pursue righteousness. That's the cry that God gives to us. Would you bow your heads with me? I wouldn't dare ask anybody to do anything other than just to indicate, hey, pastor, I, I'm, I'm going after the wrong thing, but I want to change. I want my life to change, and I want to make that decision because it starts with you. It's your choice. God will never make you, but once you become a believer, God wants to impart righteousness to your life, and that means he helps us to Get our lives into shape where we can serve God and be a, a light to those around us. It's so important that we do that. Before I pray and uh, give you some instructions about lunch today, before I pray, I'm going to ask you this now. If, you're, if you would, you're so gut honest with God that you'd say, Pastor, not to everybody but to the Lord, mainly, and I'm going to ask you to, to slip your hand up. Just put it up and down in just a moment. We're not going to ask you to come forward. That's not what it's about today, but it's about making a decision. I want my pursuit to be after God and his righteousness. I want that to be number one in my life. I want to make that the focal point of my life. And if you may have gotten off base or been hindered or distracted, got your attention someplace else that's not the right place, today's the day to bring it back, just to say to God, Lord, I'm going after you, Lord. I'm going after you, and I want to be filled. I want to be satisfied. I'll tell you, it's satisfaction with a dissatisfied satisfaction. It means the more you get, the more you want. The more your capacity is enlarged, the more you want God. If that's you this morning, Pastor, I haven't been pursuing him as I should, but I, I'm, from this moment forward, just slip your hand up and down. Just put it up and down. God bless you. Anybody else? I'm going after God. You know what? You're saying one or two things. You're either saying, I'm already going after him 100%, or you're saying, I don't intend to. You can do either. God gives you that choice. But you'll never be satisfied until he fills every nook and cranny of your heart. One more time. You didn't raise your hand, but you wished you had. Now's your time. Slip it up and down. Nobody's going to think you're a bad person. It's just that you're making a decision today. Pastor, I'm going after God. I'm going after God. Anyone else? I don't know what it's going to take to million for some of you, but I can tell you this. If you hang around God long enough, he's going to do whatever it takes to get your attention. 
It's always better to just hearken to his word. Saves you a lot of grief. Saves you a lot of trouble. Would you stand with me this morning? And would you just with me thank God for making himself so available to us? He's not remote. He is eminent. He's around. He's with us. He's high and lifted up, yes, but he is eminent. He's available today. I sense his presence here. Can I say it this way? God is in this place. I felt it in my prayer room at the house. I said, man, I love it when the anointing of the Holy Spirit just makes Jesus become real. Would you lift your hands to him? And let's just bless him this morning. Lord, I love you this morning more than I can ever say. I thank you today that you have included me. And I thank you, Lord, that you've opened my eyes not to beat us down, but to whet our appetites. To entice us to come after you because you're available and ready to fill our hearts with that which satisfies. That which makes our life so complete. Oh, we praise you for those who responded today. And we thank you, Lord. And I pray that you will help us, God, to be a blessing to them, pointing them and leading them in the right direction, whether it's in a grow class or a KLS class or a service, that we help people get to.